Yeah, thank you. Great. Great, great. Okay. Very well, Katana. You still can. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Um, I think I'm doing academia right because I completely winged the like what I was going to say. <laughs> um, but I took a chance yesterday at this nice social event to talk to lots of you to try to figure out well who we are in this room um, and what could be interesting uh, for me to share. And then it's going to be a bit of a biographical approach as well. And I'm feeling very uh, inspired by what Sophie said. I think we asked a lot of the same questions. We came up with different answers. Um, I don't think there's necessarily one that's more right than the other. Um, but um, yeah, I'm going to ask some of the same questions in a slightly different way, I think. Um, right. So there we go. Screen. Um, no, I want a black black slide actually. It's not a day. It doesn't matter. Is it on? Um, yeah, it ah, it doesn't want to show black slide. I think the black slide only works powerful. Whatever. I just like the vibe of just Sorry, talking without the slide. <laughs> so that's that's it doesn't matter. Um, so I was born in '92. Um, and I grew up thinking that you know the, there was a problem with the environment. Uh, but there were people taking care of it. Um, I learned in school about sustainable development, and there was the Agenda 21, uh, and Greenpeace was having lots of uh, petitions to sign and all these things. And I went on to study ecology and evolution at the University of Lyon in France. So I studied ecology, right? And I learned a few things about the climate and the environment in general, but really not that many. Um, it was all very academic. I've seen plots and graphs and heard figures being told in a rather cold way by professors. Um, and then I just was left pretty um, un unconcerned, thinking this was far away into the future and some people were taking care of it. Um, and afterwards, I started a PhD in Zurich in Switzerland on the evolution of sex. I'm an evolutionary biologist, I was doing a lot of modeling, computer work, uh, pretty happy with this stuff. Um, and then this happened in November 2018, and I saw that on Facebook. So what was that? It's an old British lady being arrested for blocking a bridge in London with um, thousands of people. They shut down five bridges suddenly in 2019. They were called Extinction Rebellion. And these people were saying the climate crisis is so fucking bad that we're willing to be jailed for that. And this to me was very, shocking and arresting um and in one single picture on facebook i was like shit if people are ready to do that this must be so much worse than what i was thinking and this effect is so fundamental i believe into how we can communicate the crisis and it is uh, acting as if the truth is real so these people were looking at basically the science of how it's going and being like what is an appropriate reaction to that and then going out in the public sphere and and doing that and showing to people um that it matters so much that they're willing to go to this uh, extent so after i saw that um i looked up extinction rebellion of course uh, but i also just looked at all the science also being myself an ecologist i was privileged enough to be able to um, assess for myself if this was a reasonable reaction. And um, I found that it's a pretty reasonable reaction, yes. Um, this is the last 20,000 years, um, and it's temperature, the mean uh, temperature of the world globally and over a year. Um, this is where people started to do agriculture um, 10,000 years ago. And the climate has been incredibly stable in all this time, and this is where we know we can do agriculture and especially at the scale we need right now to feed 7 billion people. Um, and then came the Industrial Revolution, and the temperature due to our CO2 emissions did this. So we already right now in 2023 have a temperature that has raised by 1.2 degrees compared to before we started to emit CO2 by burning fossil fuel. You know that the Paris Agreement says that we should do everything to stay below 1.5 because it's a uh, temperature increase that risks triggering very harmful tipping points and there would be no going back from that. We already are at 1.2 and this is our trajectory based on our current policies and what we're doing. So we're contemplating um, the end of the century uh, increase of temperature globally of plus four degrees. Um, 
But actually, this way of quantifying global warming is pretty shit because actually it's a global um, average, right? Um, and we live on a planet. What, what color is the planet? Blue. Yes, it's the blue planet. 70% of it are water. Do we live in the water? No, we don't. Um, the water doesn't heat as much as the land. So in general, if you want to imagine what a plus four world uh, means, um, if you happen to live on land, it would be a plus eight world. In general, you can multiply by two the average to get what people who are on land experience on land. Um, and now I'm going to show you just some illustration of what it could mean, because these are just numbers once more, right? But what is it going to mean for people? Um, it's one article among many that shows it in a very telling way, um, I do find, which is called the future of the human climate niche. What's the climate niche? Is the climate within which humans as animals have developed, can survive. It's not too hot, it's not too dry, it's not too cool. Um, and right now on the planet, there are areas that are hot deserts um, and on which we cannot grow food and we cannot live. Um, these deserts have a mean annual temperature of above 30 degrees. Um, would someone uh, volunteer a number, like how many percents of the land are such deserts? It's not that many. Me? Yeah, um, behind you. Okay. Yeah. Four percent, I'd say. Not bad. So it's about two percent. Okay. Now, based on our tra current trajectory, in 2070, so that's in 40 years, 40, 48, 43 years, it's like a lot of us will be alive then. Uh, we all know people will be alive in, in 50 years. The world, if we do not stop global warming, will, will have heated so much that this will become 20% of land masses that are too hot to be inhabited. And this mm -hmm. here shows in black um, the areas that are already such deserts. It's the Sahara, the Sahel. Um, and everything that is stripy, reddish, a bit disgusting here um, is areas that in 50 years might become completely uninhabitable. And this is... Um, all the south of Central America, the north of South America, all the north of Africa, the Middle East, India, not a very populated area, uh, Southeast Asia, no one lives there, uh, and the north of Australia. And this represents 2.5 billion people. So if we don't stop this in 50 years, half of the population of the Earth will have a choice between being dead or having moved to try and find safety somewhere else, somewhere else in a world which is heating dangerously as well. And this is known by our governments. This is information that is available. And there's no plan. There's no plan for that. And it's not a magical switch that it will happen in 50 years, right? It has already started. There's already are. Uh, in Madagascar, a couple of years ago, there was a famine due to climate change. Um, there are places where the temperature becomes lethal. It's so wet and so like so humid and so hot that you cannot thermoregulate as a as a primate, as a human, you can't sweat. Uh, and if you don't have access to air conditioning, you will just die. So these are things that are starting to happen more and more every year. So that is what we're looking at in our lifetime. And our decision makers know that. Um, one thing that is in, very important to figure out is that um, it's not only about the climate sciences, right? It's also about the social sciences of um, what do we do, of course, but how do we force people who need to do things to do them? And I'm just going to give a short telling example from Switzerland, where I work and live, um, of how corrupt governments can be. Um, and the Swiss government is uh, very corrupt, but um, we all come from different countries that have various levels of corruption uh, regarding the oil industry, the um, car industry, the agricultural industry that are responsible for a big share of climate change. So in Switzerland, the biggest party is the far right party. It's called the uh, Democratic Union of the Center. <laughs> Everything that's in the title. And um, the president of this party I uh, was also the president of Swiss Oil, the union of oil importers in Switzerland, and Auto Schweiz, the union of car importers in Switzerland. This guy has been uh, elected uh, as a minister. That's how we work there. 
and now he is the Minister of the Environment, Energy, Transport and Telecommunication. He is basically the oil and car industry, so he doesn't work for the people. Um, and this is a fact that not very many people know in Switzerland, and whenever the media interview this guy or talk about him, they do not give you context, uh, which is also um, quite a big failure of the, of the media in general. Okay, why am, am I making this um, segue there? We are quite fucked. And we need to move super fast. A big chunk of this can still be avoided if we would manage to have emissions really sink and reach zero in the coming decades. One thing I want to be really clear about is the following. Every fraction of a degree matters. And giving up is never an option. Because when we only have crumbs left, crumbs are going to mean everything. So there's no moment where we can think, it's too late, I give up. We have to keep fighting for all the crimes we can get because they mean everything. So I don't have answers about what to do. I never had them. I kept asking myself questions when I realized all this um, shit that was going on while I was happy and doing my PhD. Um, but I did have questions and um, I don't want to give you answers as in they are my good, the good answers, mine, but I think the questions should be asked um, to ourselves by everyone. And the first one is, what are our responsibilities in this time? In this time of history, in this time of humanity? We are the people who are alive now, basically the last generation that can really fix this shit in any meaningful, significant way. Other question, if not me, if I'm not willing to really have a deep look at what I'm doing right now, is that the good thing? What could I do that's more useful? If not me, who? No one's coming to save us. And the last one is, if not now, when? Because we're running out of time and we all have excuses. Early career scientists, I mean, a PhD is a pretty fucking big stressful thing, right? Our careers depend on it. Not now. Well, postdocs, you know, they're on the ejectable seat, they need to publish. Uh, not now. Professors, super busy. Not now. No one has the free time to do this job. And this job needs to be done. We need to find a way to force the people in power to take the right decisions. Um, so after asking myself these questions, um, I got involved right away into Extinction Rebellion. Um, on the side of my PhD, and I can tell you that my anxiety went down all of a sudden, I could sleep. I did not realize it, but I did have uh, some kind of eco-anxiety, I believe, because I didn't sleep that well. And the moment I was involved in this stuff, um, I could sleep again. Um, and this feels great. <laughs> um, however, I didn't know what I was doing at all regarding activism. It was sort of not my first time, but near enough. And when I was seeing these people in the UK that had a plan, I was just like, Take my body, put it wherever, I will trust you. But in Switzerland, we didn't have that. We had to figure it out. We had no idea what we were doing. We started Extinction Rebellion there without understanding the principles. And that's my most important finding about all of that. Um, social movements uh, are not random. People uh, know what they're doing or learn to do uh, things that work. And there's a long history of social movements. Um, there's a lot of social sciences about social movements, and you can figure out things that consistently produce the same effects, yay, science, um, and that actually work. Um, so these are things I've like painfully learned also over, over the years. Um, one of the, no, I'm not going to go there. Eh, I can't have black slides. Anyway, so I was finishing my PhD at the time and then um, still working also part-time in Extinction Rebellion in Switzerland. Um, and then I moved on to doing a postdoc and this time I chose something a lot more applied and I worked at um, Polytech Zurich in a lab that studies applied ecosystem restoration and climate change. Also using a big data approach and trying to pull data from all the projects around the world that do restoration to try to learn as fast as ever we can how to do it right, because we don't have much time, right? So this research is super useful, super timely, super critical. 
And yet, after a year and a half, I quit my job. I quit my research career. Because even this is not the main bottleneck. And Sophie said it before, and people said it before. Um, right now, uh, we can learn a lot more that would be rather useful. But if there's no action using what we've learned, it's just all for nothing. And what we discover about ecosystems is getting obsolete every year because the world is warming so fucking fast. So basically, my takeaway from this year and a half in this lab is that we are losing everything. We're losing everything. This is forensic science. I was just looking at how stuff disappears. Uh, we cannot restore an ecosystem to a state that no longer exists on the planet. Um, and another thing I noticed was that my colleagues are somehow aware of that. Of course, they work all day long with traumatizing data, um, but then they put a distance, of course. They, they know all this stuff, um, but you can go crazy or, or depressive or, you know, or quit your job if you let that affect you emotionally too much. And as scientists, we're also trained to be objective, to be rational. A lot of us are men who've been trained from birth to be like that, so it's great. Talking about emotions is not easy. Um, and so I've noticed as well among my colleagues that they see all this stuff that it needs such urgent action and they're still just thinking that it's enough for them to do their research and do their part. Um, and for me, what I realized was um, if I quit my postdoc, another equally talented, even more talented, uh, most certainly postdoc is going to take my role in this lab, do the research. But people like me who've just looked at this situation in the face and made ask themselves hard questions and have learned a bit about how social movements work are not that many. So if not me, who? And that's when I went full time into um, activism and especially civil disobedience. So that's one example of um, some people who are doing uh, direct action within academia. And I'm also part of this group that is called Scientist Rebellion. Um, it was an offshoot of Extinction Rebellion at the beginning, but by some scientists who wanted to actually target and disrupt scientists themselves. And at first, there was a bit of a um, pushback from a lot of people in Extinction Rebellion being like, but scientists, they're our allies. We don't want to attack them. We don't want to disrupt, challenge them. Um, but basically, what these people, these two founders uh, decided to do was, no, 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 no. We need to disrupt our allies and our own communities. That's tough love, you know, but like they need to step up as scientists. We have access. We have the, the privilege of knowing. Therefore, we have the duty to act, which I believe is a genuine Einstein quote, not a made up Einstein quote, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, so their first action as scientists rebellion was to go to the Royal Society and to just splash paint on it and put some pretty scary scientific paper on it and be arrested for that. And that's how scientists rebellion um, was born. And this was three years ago, and it spread to over 30 countries. It has thousands of scientists whose goal is what? To challenge academia and our own institutions to have these conversations, to collectively talk about this stuff, um, but also to go out and tell the public. Because I'm coming back to what does it look like to act as if the truth is real? The scientists, the people who work on these topics or who understand these topics, issue warnings. And then citizens see them just going back to the lab, um, working to become one day a professor, business as usual. What does it say? We tend to believe and react more strongly to acts than to words. And so if scientists say the scary words, but then just carry on as normal, no one can believe this. This is not trustworthy. So that's also part of scientists' rebellion is to get scientists into civil resistance with civil disobedience movements to add credibility to these civil resistance movements and to behave as if the truth is real. Believe our own silence, basically. Um, it's uh, quite widespread in the global south where scientists there are feeling like they're shouting in a vacuum. So Scientist Rebellion is also trying to lift, us, uh, lift up these voices. Um, and it's been it's gone quite viral um, a year ago and this year again with global actions in uh, over 20 countries, and these are colleagues in Madrid who just have this incredible sense of scenography. It's their parliament. Uh, it looks like, I don't know, it looks like a painting. It's hell. Um, they were all arrested for that, um, and it made the news uh, worldwide, and it significantly changed the discourse during this period around um, climate change. 
because people have to explain why scientists are getting arrested and uh, panicking, basically. Um, one important thing here is that you'll notice um, the things I've shown so far, um, blocking bridges, um, doing these like very scenic things in public, it is targeting first things, the public by disrupting the public emotionally or blocking them on their way to work and so on. Why is that? Because the public's not really the problem, is it? Like, sure, individual action is part of the solution, but it's really not all of that. We are embedded in structures in a society that forces us to, to pollute uh, and emit CO2. So why are these movements targeting the public? Because in the end, the real power is with the public, with the population. The population can remove social license to companies. The population can um, rebel against the government, can elect another government. You need to get the population to move. And this is why um, we are targeting the public. Uh, now, question for scientists. Uh, won't activism affect my credibility? This is something we ask ourselves a lot. And actually, we tend to ask it to ourselves because uh, other people ask it, uh, typically the media and the industry and uh, right wing politicians um, are like, yeah, but you're going to your credibility is going to suffer. Actually, it won't. Um, this is a bunch of papers that show that uh, whenever it's been studied, if a scientist does activism with integrity based on uh, the real results that they have, um, it only increases their credibility they walk the talk and for the population this makes a lot of sense um now why scientists we might have a feeling that especially after this entire covid episode uh, there's less trust in science this is things that are worrying that we we seem to notice and so on but it's actually not all that true this is a map with um um the trust people have in different um actors of their life uh, blue is a lot of trust and like red is not much trust so people in the world tend to trust their neighbors, uh, not in Brazil. Um, people tend to not super much trust their governments with some nice little blissful pockets uh, where they do poor things. And um, people who trust journalists and people who trust scientists. Most trusted after. You're more trusted than people's neighbors, in a sense. So it is a huge moral responsibility as well for scientists to speak to the public, to level with the public, to say that if we're afraid, to say why, um, to connect the dots. Okay. Um, so back to my own journey. Um, I, when I quit my job, basically a year ago, a year and a half ago with some uh, friends I had been um, doing a lot of Extinction Rebellion work with, we decided to start a new campaign based on everything we had learned uh, and trying to apply things that we knew tended to work. Our goal um, is to force the Swiss government to take a first meaningful measure um, for the climate. And we picked a demand which is completely unsexy uh, but completely consensual and actually really important and meaningful, both for people in their lives and for uh, our CO2 emissions in the country. Um, in Switzerland, most houses are super poorly insulated. It's also the case in France, the UK, lots of countries. Um, so it's a lot of uh, energy waste and CO2 emissions for nothing. So we decided to take this and ask the Swiss government to make a plan to renovate Switzerland. And if they cannot do this thing, we know how to, it's consensual, it's hard to believe they will do anything else. They themselves say it's important to do it. So we picked this demand and we were like, okay, uh, we are going to build a movement that will have enough firepower to uh, paralyze the country uh, if needed and force people to take position on it. I'm not gonna go through um, all the strategic principles, um, but enough to say, um, this is what a roadblock looks like. And we are still building power. So we work in phases of mobilization phases, action phases, and every time getting bigger. Um, well, that's me sitting on a road. That's a friend being um, removed by the police. And this is an IPCC lead offer. Um, who has been a speaker here? Who has been a speaker here? Years ago. Wonderful. That's Julia Sandberger. 
who now uh, works at the University of Lausanne, um, lead author from a uh, working group of the IPCC. And she joined us and she sat on that room. And she said that when the last IPCC report came up um, last year, which was a pretty important, scary one, um, she got media requests for three days. After she sat on the road, she got media requests for a month, during which obviously she could talk about the climate science. So for her, just in terms of SciComm, <laughs> this is very good use of time. Um, you might have known uh, all the campaigns signal out to us because we are actually part of a network called the A22 network in lots of countries. This was in France by the campaign called Dernière Renovation. Um, does, does anyone remember this image? It was during Roland Garros last year, lots of heads nodding. This is Alizé. Um, she just went to make a complete fool of herself by interrupting Roland Garros. Everyone hated her, but what it did was that there was a huge traffic to the website of Dernière Renovation and lots of people signing up to their talks and then coming to their trainings and then ending up on the road. So we know what we're doing. This got attention. This got people on our website. This got people on the road. This just otherwise doesn't really do anything, right? It's just very performative. But we know how to use this sort of stuff to make real gains to grow our movements. Um, this is also throwing tomato soup on a Van Gogh that happened in London by the, the campaign Just of Oil also got worldwide attention massive amount of traffic. Most people hate it, but a bunch of people join every time. And that's how the campaigns grow. Um, and such campaigns exist in 12 countries uh, that are Western democracies. And basically, we're trying to replicate uh, strategies and tactics that we know might work um, or not. <laughs> uh, but by having lots of replicates, we're at least giving it a proper shot. We're collecting a lot of data on how it works, what brings people to talks, how the media reacts to stuff. Um, what we do, what the effect is in the background. Um, and some of these campaigns have already scored really big wins. In France, Dernier Innovation has uh, managed to really put the topic of uh, home insulation super prominently on the agenda. In Switzerland, we've done that as well. And we see that it's moving. Um, but most importantly, let me see how behind I am. It's good. It's good. Um, most importantly for me, for me personally, um doing three things one is that i believe we have a shot at scoring in one of these countries a first really big win um that would then be the beginning of something like making the climate movement feel we can actually make wins because it hasn't happened in a while um and this could spiral into demanding more mm -hmm. faster and bigger because home insulation is only the beginning i don't care much about home insulation it's great but like that's not everything right so i do have some hope that we are giving it a good shot and we are learning what we're doing for me personally it's been an amazing incredible sense of community um in runway switzerland um last briefing i was at we were 50 people um so rather small group, but among these 50, there were teenagers, people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Which makes me think that if I'm crazy, I'm not the only one, and it doesn't correlate with age, and I don't know why I find it reassuring. Um, so the, this, this community that we are building is also very important to just keep us, just, like, we're not crazy, right? Um, it's a community of courage as well. And a third thing that's, that is very important to me as well, on my pessimistic days, is that um, we are going towards more authoritarian societies, probably. And every single person we train or inspire to have the guts to say no and put a red line they will not cross, for me, is a win. Everyone who learns to say no and resist in a dignified way is a win, whatever happens. And if we go down, we will go down with our head, head held high and with principles. It's more my nihilistic uh, side, but to me, it matters super much. Um, right, so with these movements, I've been arrested over 10 times, there's stuff I can talk about later, but whatever. Uh, what is really important to say is that uh, the people who are on the road and getting arrested are really just the tip of the iceberg. 
So for every person arrested, there's been 10 people doing things that are perfectly legal and safe, organizing talks, firing, uh, answering on social media, fundraising, organizing the action, all this kind of stuff. Um, so basically, what I'm trying to hint at there is that whatever your own answer is to what should I do, what are my responsibilities in this, uh, in this time, whether inside your job, outside your job, outside your job as a citizen or as a scientist, completely leaving academia, any of these answers, um, there is something that can fit your profile risk, your risk profile. And there's work that really needs to be done. Um, now I'm going to just briefly explain the principles uh, we work on with um, nonviolent conflict. What is it? Um, basically, if you want to learn more about that, you need to Google nonviolent conflict and try to find more about that because there's a lot of resources and this is not stuff that is improvised. Um, it's been stuff that's been tested and theorized by Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and a bunch of other people. But I find that Luther King uh, is very eloquent about it. And he says that nonviolent direct action is meant to create a crisis such that a community that has consistently refused to negotiate is forced to confront the problem. So nonviolence is not just like being passive. It's nonviolent conflict. It's a method of conflict. It's a method of creating trouble, but in a nonviolent way. What does nonviolent mean? Um, not only just like not hitting people, it's more about the attitude as well, which is an attitude of respect and dignity and coming in peace, but being relentless and stubborn. And why is it very important? Because at the end of the day, we don't want to create escalating conflicts of people who win and people who lose, who hate the ones who win and who will come back with a vengeance over time. Um, and this is why it's been so successful for the civil rights in the US uh, in general. So what are some ba basic pillars of it? Um, first of all, by sitting on that highway, we don't create a conflict. The conflict's already there. Our government's not doing anything to save our lives. The emissions are rising. There's a huge fucking conflict there. So we're just taking it and surfacing it and putting it in everyone's head, in everyone's face, forcing people to take position. So we create a tension in society, which we want to be a productive one. And like with, as if you're playing music, if you're playing the violin and your string is too tense, it might break. That's if there's too much tension and it feels too violent, you might have a break. But if your string's too low, there's no tension, you're just asking politely, doing petitions, you can't play any music on it. There's no tension. So you need to tune it just right. Um, that's an excellent quote from Martin Luther King, which is, so inspiring to me that peace is not the absence of tension. If there's a society where you don't feel any tension, it doesn't mean there's peace. It might be that everything's just repressed. Um, peace is the presence of justice, not the absence of tension. So by creating tension as part of our campaigns, uh, we are not the problem there. Um, we're targeting the public, why? Because they need to step up and do things. And this is an act of communication. Disruption works, countless examples over time. Disruption is necessary and so that people can just, you know, step out as I did when I saw these images during my PhD of old ladies being arrested and disruption isn't pleasant, which means that a lot of people hate to be disrupted. Um, and even with small things, like some of you said that talking about some aspects of some question you had in your labs, apparently elicits a very uh, negative reaction from colleagues because you're disrupting their thought patterns. It's unpleasant and you might get um, flack for it. But whenever you disrupt, the theory is um, a bunch of people might be uh, find it unpleasant, uh, but a bunch of people would be like, yes, this is right. This is correct. I'm going to join that person. Um, to be joined and to be able to um, Solve conflicts, you do need discipline, dignity, accountability. This is this brand of direct action. We does everything in, in our names so that people can identify, see there's no hidden agenda and be inspired, be like, yes, these are normal people. I want to be like them. I want to have the same courage. I want to support them. Um, and the last one, which is uh, counterintuitive, is that it works by polarizing, polarizing people. And it's a word we tend to associate with bad, um, but it doesn't have to be. Basically, right now in society on many issues, most people care a bit or not at all, but they're not doing anything. We need to activate these people. 
So by um, doing roadblocks, for instance, we provide what is called a radical flank effect. What we do is so out there that everyone else seems very reasonable. People and groups and demands and tactics that before were considered unreasonable, suddenly they're reasonable because of us. So we've opened the discourse. The far right is extremely good at doing that. Uh, and we need to do it on the other side. Um, by disrupting and being accountable for your actions, you force your allies to step up. So basically, you're lighting a fire under your allies' feet. Why? Um, because suddenly you take a topic and you're bringing a lot of pressure on it. And so people who are also interested in the topic, they have to seize the opportunity. Um, it's, it works with everything, right? Oh, there's a doctoral school there on this topic that I'm interested in. Quick, quick, I need to register. Otherwise, you might have been like, yeah, in a, month, in a year or two, I would think about these topics. So you need to create opportunity. Um, but also, um, it works as, um, this is political jujitsu that's written here. Five minutes, yeah. Um, when you um, break a rule, an implicit rule or a law, um, and you get repressed in any way, um, just staff being, like the professors being unfair to you or the police raiding your house, whatever it is, um, some people will find this outrageous because you've been honest, you've been disciplined, you've been uh, dignified, you've been nonviolent, um, and then they will take your sides. So what it does is that it activates allies. Um, and I'm going to give you just a very quick example from academia that is not like all this stuff applies to any small thing and any big thing, not only Roblox. So a friend of mine was at the University of Fribourg. She's a junior postdoc. And she organized a scientist rebellion workshop on the campus. She wanted to recruit scientists to go and block roads. That was her goal. She organized the workshop in the university. Um, and then what happened was that some senior professors uh, wrote angry emails behind her back, being like, uh, this is completely unacceptable. This should be shut down. She should be uh, reprimanded and so on. Um, and when she learned that, she just reached out to them and was being very uh, engaging and nonviolent and respectful and inviting them to come and see it would be nice to have them there at the workshop and blah 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 um, and in the end um, it created such a fuss around her that lots of other people in the university were like you can't do that to a junior postdoc and it's not that bad and they're also quite right and it's they're right so certainly lots of people were joining the conversation in support of her who otherwise would have been disengaged um, and in the end, this little bit of troublemaking created a big discussion in the University of Fribourg, and now they're publishing a series of interviews of scientists on how they believe activism should or should not be done in academia. So she's really seeing things move. Um, and that's the final list of very concrete things, just to, to show you that this is stuff that one can learn and can't really improvise so well. Um, I'm not, I'm just going to just point a few um but like my friend who organized this workshop all the people who were interested she took their phone numbers not only their email address because you need to call people why do you need to call people because emails are very impersonal and we're asking people big questions you need to have real conversations call people proximity principle is the same if you want someone to do something or join you on your journey you need to give them next steps the simple soon in time close in in geography otherwise all the energy is going to dissipate to be able to plan that, you really need to have a plan. What are you going to do with these people? What's the next step? Always think forward as well. Um, be ready for consequences. My friend was not scared to challenge the, her university. She, it was calculated risks, but she could display complete fearlessness. And this is very inspiring. And this will make people want to follow you and find their own courage. Um, you force your opponents to slip. Uh, her university actually had very improper behavior, and uh, this created backlash and backfire and force your allies to step up in your defense or in defense of, of, of the cause. Um, and persistence, because this is a sprint. Uh, this is a marathon. We need to run like a sprint, which is not possible. And burnt out people are not useful to anyone. Um, and results are very slow to come. And you can see in history, there are periods where social movements are trying and trying, trying, nothing happens, and suddenly it explodes. And it could explode because some people were persistent and stubborn as hell and kept pushing even when it looked like it was not happening. So do keep pushing, even though you feel that it's not happening right now. That's the only way it will happen at some point. And 
personally, it helps me keep balance to find meaning in doing the right thing and being detached of the results as well. Um, and with that, um, I'll end with this quote from a suffragist from the UK, the, the women who are fighting to get the right to vote, which is that courage calls to courage everywhere. And I think to face what's coming, we all need courage in our personal lives. And we all need the courage to ask ourselves tough questions and to follow through with the answers we come up for what is right for ourselves. But by showing this courage, you will inspire others. And when your courage runs out, some others will be inspiring you in return. Um, these are the collectives I mentioned. Um, for those of you who are French, uh, which is a big bunch, the, the Campaign Dernière Renovation has an uh, info evening uh, all around France, but also every Sunday online uh, that you can join uh, to see more of what they do and what the plan is. And that's it for me. Um, thanks for your attention. And lots of courageous questions. <laughs> lots of courageous questions. Um, can I start with you on the side? Uh, yes. Yeah. You. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so who, who's the, lady, the lady behind Nicola. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is about the um, uh, the posture of challenges uh, because you you study ecology, but as a computer science, uh, uh, yes, as a computer scientist, uh, do do we have the the legitimacy to present in front of the public as a scientist and uh, talk about uh, ecology and uh, climate because this is not our area of uh, expertise. And maybe we we, we then should um, give the the scientist uh, credibility uh, in that way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do, do I need the thingy to yeah. say? Yeah. I also have a comment on that. But you go first. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So very very good point. Um, whenever you talk to a community or to people, it's really important to know the, the posture um, of like who is giving the message. So if you're only a bunch of computer scientists and you want to talk about climate, it's going to be tough. You need to also have climate scientists, ecologists for legitimacy. However, you do have other legitimacies of just being someone who's part of the system, who's embedded, who's not expected to disobey. Um, these sort of things are already very strong symbols that there's something going on and that you are willing to put this at risk um, is a huge support for other citizens as well. So not much about the, the content in that case, unless you have colleagues from the Islamic sciences, but about the, um, yeah, your social status basically as well. And in this case, the science is so clear, there's no debate, the IPCC is out there. You don't need to be a climate scientist to be able to pass these messages. So yeah, you, you can really find your own voice. And, and one thing to add, so like you have this beautiful map at the beginning with the peating areas and what turns into desert and what does not turn into desert. Like this was a projection for like, I don't know, the next 50 years. But if you look at the immediate impacts, they are actually very harsh till the end of this decade. So, for example, the IPCC has been predicting for Africa alone migration problems of 700 million people looking for a new home. So just because by 2050 this is becoming uninhabitable doesn't mean that people are moving right now. And for example, if you look at the EU's response to migration, it is a huge investment in research, in migration tech, in managing migration streams. And that is all ICT. That is all our expertise. That is all about um, um, AI in the borders to identify people, predicting mig migration streams, sorting people, automated decision making for visa applications and stuff like that, which we are currently doing in our European migration crisis that involves 1 million people per year at the peak. And by the end of this decade, this has to scale up to 700 million people and the EU thinks that we can solve this with technology. So there are connections with ICT research that are immediate and where we as ICT researchers can say that looking at Sophie's earlier three questions, 
this is just not the way to go. No way that we can scale this, no way that this is ethical, no way that technology can solve these problems in in the, the societal problems, these industrial problems, in a way that our governments expect them to be solved. And I think it is our responsibility to speak up about this. You're next. Bang on. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, next to, next to her then. Uh, sorry. Who's next? Yeah. Thanks a lot for the talks. I'm very inspiring. And uh, I have a question. Uh, the quote that you had on the end was from a suffragette, which was not a nonviolent movement. And it also worked. And I, I kind of have a question on that, which is I'm totally on with uh, nonviolence, but doesn't it also need uh, some more, even more radical groups that are? even prone to violence, not, not obviously against people, but against goods or against institutions or mm -hmm. things like that. Because like for the civil rights movements, there was uh, not only a civil king, but there was also Malcolm X mm -hmm. that also aided to open the autumn window. It's kind of like when the far right goes to do uh, mass shootings or things like that, and there's always a guy in a suit that seems normal. And that you can listen to. Mm -hmm. yep. So there is, is there a need for even more radical movements for that to to work? Thanks. Oops. Did I turn it up? Yes. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Super great question. Um, so the jury is still a bit out there as well. It's really hard to disentangle because. Um, like every moment of social tension had some violence, had different campaigns, and you can never really pinpoint who achieved what, right? Um, there's been some uh, quantitative uh, assessment, meta assessments um, by um, someone called Chen Weth and her colleague about uh, civil resistance in countries that um, removed their dictator. And the presence of very violent elements tended to actually uh, decrease the success rate and then create turmoil afterwards. It's it's really, it's, it's hard, like you can't really fully trust this data. This is stuff that needs to be discussed a lot, right? But one, one danger of uh, violence is that it will create loops of violence behind. And what we tend to want on that side of the, of the story is uh, people live happily together. Whereas what the far right wants is to maintain violence and structures. So it, it does not necessarily match um, for that. Um, it does create sometimes indeed an effect that, uh, oh, some suffragettes were very legitimate, but some others were not. Um, but it is, whenever there's violence, it, it can create a pushback, and a lot of people who might have joined will not join violent protests, especially women participation is much lower when you have violent protests. However, violence really is in the eyes of the beholder. It's not what you find violent, it's what society finds violent, even if you disagree, that matters to the dynamics. But if you want to, for instance, if you mask up in the middle of the night, you go and you uh, smash windows and you run away, lots of people will find violence in it because like, who are you? What are you going to do next? But if you show up dressed like this, maybe more elegant, I'm not elegant, dressed elegant, um, there's someone filming you and you have this like pink uh, hammer and you're like, I am smashing this window as an act of protest because the government's not doing their job and my name is this and that. Lots of people will find it. All kinds of things, but not really violent. So, violence against objects can also be considered super violent and just like, you know, also not. I hope that helps. You never consider the color of the hammer as an important aspect. Looking goofy also helps. So, I'm, I'm just going from left. To, so, you get your chance, but I'm doing these people first too, right? I have to do Thank you. I was wondering how the financial or financial avoid the accident or how and also not just the burnout itself, but uh, how you manage to not damage your surroundings, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean your personal surroundings, your close ones, mm -hmm. or the relationship between them. That's the first question. And the second one is um is more I, I heard uh, an interview of uh, a former marketer. Now he's focused on marketing about climate change. 
how we could spread the message more efficiently. And what he said, so I really don't know if you agree or not, but uh, just share. Um, he said we have a problem with the message complex. Uh, just talking about climate change, climate change is a process. It's not something that you can um, touch or see or hear or feel in the real world. Uh, people can't fight a process, they just can't fight, can fight people or, um, I don't know, machines maybe. Um, so so he, he suggested that we should talk about climate change, talk about the polluters, focus on the polluters and the people that are, let's say, mostly this. He also said that every target, like 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, 3 degrees, far too complex, yeah. doesn't ring a bell to anyone. Um, and that what seemed to work in some studies, probably there was in Florida, I think, and what they saw is that um, uh, when they talked about, okay, we should save Florida from floodings mm -hmm. that are already happening, mm -hmm. um, it, they got way more engagement from the population than when they say we should stop climate change because it will hurt Florida in the future. So he suggested to focus on events, events that are already happening. So I was wondering what's your view on that, about like, not just your movement, but in general, like, uh, should there be or not an adaptation? Mm -hmm. Super good point. Thanks. Sure. Um, I'll start with the this one while it's fresh in my mind and move on to burnout afterwards. Um, yeah, it's entirely correct. Um, it goes just from the wording. For instance, we would prefer global heating um, than uh, climate change or um, climate collapse. Um, and it's a bit of an uh, arms race whenever a word is becoming a bit too dull, you just have to keep on finding a new one to still make it fresh. So people are like, oh, collapse, oh, crisis, oh. Um, so that, there's that. And some media, for instance, like The Guardian, are also changing the way they talk. Instead of saying climate change, they will say global heating, climate crisis. Um, so that's just this level. Um, our network of campaigns has, ex it's exactly for this reason that we've chosen to have very bread and butter demands. People can relate. People live in a home that gets cold in the, in the winter and very hot in summer, and they will understand why uh, renovation is good. They uh, understand why they burn fuel for heating and so on. So it is quite critical to make it concrete for people, um, indeed, definitely. And then the last one is to politicize it and talking about opponents. Also really important because the obfuscation is incredible. No, like, like quick question. Um, you know the um, your individual carbon footprint. Maybe who has already calculated one day their individual carbon footprint? Okay, great. M most of us. Um, did you know that this tool was invented by the fossil fuel industry? Who who knew that? Yeah, yeah a bunch. Mm -hmm. um, but like. Environmental uh, activists keep on propagating this ourselves, right? And it, it's all these tools that really obfuscate responsibility. And then it's all us, we pollute, we should change lifestyle, not eat meat, not fly, not fly. all these things correct. But uh, it's hiding the fact that some people are selling these things and marketing these things. So um, I, for me personally, every time I can, I mention the oil industry uh, very clearly and the ties it has to the government. Um, because in the end, this is one of the most powerful um, industries on earth, um, not the only one who's causing the problem, but um, naming fossil fuels and the fossil fuel industry is very important. Also for people to feel that they're, um, like when you've been doing wrong personally, like, you know, flying and eating meat and so on, you find it hard to admit that maybe you should change that. But once you see it as in, I've been sold all this shit, I'm, I'm like brainwashed with all these ads. These people are trying to hide the truth from me. Then people can get angry and they can still feel a bit good about themselves. Um, and so that's, I find a very good way to make people, to enrage people, that, to tell them you've been lied to and manipulated. So that's a good one. And I'll move quickly on to burnout. Uh, tough. Um, I've had a couple. <laughs> um, what I found was it like try to figure out what stresses you the most. For me, I get chat burnout very easily. So I just organize chats uh, in a much better way, I have like safe places where just my friends texting and so on. Tiny personal anecdote. 
um, I find that you really, really need to be super disciplined about free time. <laughs> Um, and now I've been doing full-time activism for a couple of years. Um, and I do think that having a part-time job that has nothing to do with it, even cashier, might help with my balance. So always be open to you know, having different activities if it keeps you uh, sane. And about uh, your loved ones, um, everyone would find a different answer. Um, some climate communicators say we need to have these conversations everywhere. And lots of you had them at the coffee machine with colleagues that are not super receptive. So it is important to have them. But at the end of the day, um, as a climate mobilizer, I've been a lot on the street talking to people, flyering and so on. I'm not trying to convince people. I'm trying to find the people who are already convinced or near convinced and activate them. And with this mindset, it's more like seeing through a lot of data, looking for the right people. And if your loved ones are not the right people, it's okay. Don't don't keep going at them. Just enjoy their company. They give you strength, and that's already a lot. And then try to find talk to as many people as possible to find the right ones. You have like two or three minutes left. So keep it short, and then someone over there wants to ask a question. No? Yeah, I don't. No? Okay. Oh, go. I had a very small uh, comment on the violence question because I think it's a very important question. Uh, we find it very difficult to speak about violence, like a role in violence and social change and mobilization. And like the civil liberties movement, also the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, there was a lot of like violence was part of the entire political repertoire and mm -hmm. spectrum. And sort of, I think it's, if you need to be very specific what we talk about, because if we talk to uh, people of color and marginalized communities, Community protection is a form of violence. If the police comes in with, a, with guns and belly clubs, what can you do other than stand there? So I think we have to be very clear about the taxonomy. We can break things. There were the Luddite movement who broke uh, machines of capitalism, but actually they were the predecessors of the union. So they had a very important role in sort of claiming stakes of social mobilizations. For me, riots with Belaclavas, so what that happened in France, is an expression of extreme oppression of certain groups. And maybe it doesn't lead to something, but I think it's unchanneled. And I would never conflate these things with extreme right uh, groups that burn down houses of refugees, because that is just manslaughter and murder. And I think we should like really be explicit what we talk about, because this is actually what the status quo always tries to conflate. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, community protection is something is the same as sort of extreme right going into and breaking things. And there's a very interesting book from Peter Geldroos who said um, uh, vi non-violence protects the state. And it, it really inverts sort of this idea also how we talk about violence. So I'm not arguing for violent protests, but I think we should have the capacity to talk about it, especially more in the progressive left uh, side of uh, the world. I could put a link to the book on the by myself. Want to comment? Uh, yeah, thanks. I agree with all that. Um, except I didn't find the book good at all. <laughs> I think he um, argues against a lot of straw men or things that were very really specific to the, the US. But like, there were many different theorizing of nonviolence. I find Gandhi awful because the guy was really like, it was during the Second World War, he was like, um, oh yeah, if Europeans would just let themselves be killed at some point, the Nazis would get bored because they still need people. It's like, no, <laughs> I'm not on board with that. Um, and Martin Luther King, for instance, was a lot less uh, in, in this doctrine and self-defense. Here again, it's in the eyes of, of the beholder and we want to change the eyes of, of the beholder. And so for me, it's very important to, like in case of riots, for instance, to not condemn and extend solidarity in some ways. Um, and yeah, exactly. Just try to make the eyes of the beholder, beholder see this as even nonviolent violence in some cases as well. Like it could, it, it can also be. Um, I think, like, for instance, I found this really interesting when the, um, the war broke out in Ukraine, when Russia invaded, um, the, like, Ukraine started this program for prisoners of war to be able to let their parents identify them and go and fetch them, which is actually breaking the laws of war because you're not supposed to do things with prisoners of war. So I'm not commenting on whether they should have done it. But in a sense, it was very, it was nonviolent warfare in a way because they were like, we have to kill people because we're uh, being attacked but we are repairing the relationship by letting you get your sons back. And this was such a great move I found to try and get the mothers in there to be their allies in some sense. So, yeah. Also thinking strategically and, and reacting emotionally is two different things and you, when you need to react, you need to react. Any more interventions? Can I yeah, okay, sure.
um, like when you're talking about violence, like you also said something about like doing what is right for you to do. Um, and I think that's also an aspect of that, that it's it's up to you to determine what like what feels right and like to to I don't know to find an ethical path forward in the crisis we're in. Um, and I think like you can also you shouldn't always think like is it effective the violence, but it's also like what I want to do in this time or something. You mm -hmm. I, I I think I understand. Um, do I get the same? <laughs> Yeah, I think to, to each their own. Um, for me personally, it's important to know that what I'm doing is not counterproductive. And with violence, it, it can be. Or it, sometimes it's not, but it's, it has a high risk of turning people off. And it's being used as full flag, false, flag, false flag operations as well by opponents. Um, so it's really tricky. Um, so it needs to feel right for you, certainly. But uh, also, I think it's important to think strategically, at least give it a shot. Uh, knowing that there's no right answer, but that we're sure 100 percent is correct. So yeah, um, good, good take. Quick, quick last one. Okay, last one. Okay. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Yeah. What would be uh, your next strategy regarding criminalization of climate activists? Since we press was going straight into that. Yeah. Um, so it's scary. Um, here again, it's political jujitsu, and you need to react to your opponent's reaction. And sometimes the opponent overreacts, and people will show you solidarity. Sometimes your opponent overreacts so brutally that it actually destroys you. So it really, people need to be prepared for for consequences. Um, my own case right now in Switzerland, for instance, I've been arrested over ten times. I have a criminal record, lots of fines. That I intend not to pay just to see what will happen um, and I'm ready to do a little bit of jail time um, like a couple of months maybe um, and so I'm trying to to get to that level but I can still control things um, sometimes uh, like in Germany or in France right now uh, the repression can be super brutal I think you always need to prepare your movement for what's coming to the best of your Christians um, especially the leaders of the movement because if you're going to get solidarity, it's by by making people relate to the people who are being repressed. It's super important. Um, but one thing I just want to say is that, like the pivotal movement of um, the civil rights movement, nonviolent disobedience campaign, was the Freedom Riders. Have you ever heard of the episode of the Freedom Riders? It's super not known, um, but it was really the start of something huge. And so it was just a bunch of black and white students who decided to challenge the segregation laws on buses and to ride a bus together from Washington DC to the most segregationist uh, South. And they just sat on buses and the bus got burned. They were beaten. They were, there were uh, attempts of murder and all this stuff. And then when they sent to jail and then a bunch of other people came to pick up the ride where they had left it. And also they wrote their wills before leaving because they thought they might get murdered. But these people in this stage were like, I will not take more of this shit. It's unacceptable. I have to oppose this with all I got. Um, so people have faced, obviously people face everywhere uh, oppression and, and violence all the time. I'm saying this kind of brand of direct action. Um, what we risk right now is still not even comparable to what people risked in some iconic campaigns. Um, yeah, and I don't know how we work out the courage to face that that these people had. Um, yeah. It's probably a nice closing, right? Nice. <laughs>